what, what actually was included in the very beginning when we wrote the bit. On the other hand, it's very much linked to the topic of the presentation of the school, because as you know, actually Erasmus for All, um, in general, uh, the uh, one of the main of the chief goal of the chief goals of the Erasmus for All is actually to correspond to the modernization agenda and to contribute to the uh, uh, completion of, of those of those um, tasks and areas. So the floor is over to Gail. Hi. So I, despite the presentation being very relevant to what we do, I believe most of you would be quite familiar with what I'm saying. And I'm really sorry if I bore some of you, uh, but um, I think it's a good way to wrap up the work for the last three days. And I want to make that very informal. So um, whenever you wish to say something or if you feel something sh could be or should be discussed, please interrupt me and we will do it like that. I will not be, I don't insist on going through the whole presentation and then opening the floor to questions and answers. It's fine if you just jump in and uh, introduce some topic of discussion. So first, uh, a little bit uh, about the background, the context of the uh, agenda for the modernization of European higher education systems. It is, uh, as, the, as was mentioned in the previous presentation, it is very much based on the development and growth agenda of the European Union, which is most clearly and most famously stated in the Europe 2020 strategy. Um, you all know the strategy is basically a vision about how uh, Europe can achieve a smart, sustainable and inclusive growth so that uh, it can compete with the other parts of the world. And one precondition for that to happen, to achieve this smart, sustainable and inclusi inclusive growth is basically uh, to develop the knowledge-based economy. And the knowledge in the knowledge-based economy, very simply said, knowledge, research, innovation, and technology, these are the key res resources and uh, areas that are supposed to um, produce economic benefits and to um, create jobs, not the traditional economic sectors. And therefore, they, in this, in the, development agenda of the European Union, they do get a lot of attention and additional funding. Um, and if you look at the new multi-annual financial framework 2014-2020, you will notice that there is significant increase for the, uh, in the budget which is devoted to education, research and innovation. Um, and because innovation and knowledge um, is, I mean, it's education and particularly higher education that is responsible for innovation and research. Um, that's why it's supposed to be developing in a way which would make it possible for Europe to achieve these um, high goals that it has set itself with the Europe 2020 strategy. So this is about the context. So before we continue with the agenda itself, um, maybe it makes sense first to have a look at where European education is right now, and, and as we speak, uh, how far are we in, in achieving those goals? And if you look at the data, unfortunately, European higher education institutions are not exactly where they are supposed to be, or where they should be. Uh, very, to make the long story short, uh, Europe is not the leader in the global competition for knowledge and innovation right now. Uh, so if you look at the estimates, uh, it is uh, estimated that by, Europe, by year 2020, 35% of all the jobs in the European Union will require high level qualifications, which can only be achieved either through higher education or equivalent. Uh, currently, only 26% of the workforce has such qualifications. So this is how 9% difference, and it makes for, if you transfer it into number of people, it's 16 million people, more people we need with uh, higher education until the year 2020, which is approaching <laughs> very fast. Um, if you look at the share of um, 
researchers in the total labor force, which is uh, on average in, in, the US in the EU currently it's 6%. We are again lagging behind. Uh, the US where it's 9% and especially Japan where it's 11%. And to make matters worse, it seems that the labor force, even whether or not it has higher education, it seems to have the wrong mix of skills very often. Uh, so um, basically both private and public employers, especially those that are in more research intensive areas, they find it difficult to find the right people for the right jobs most of the time. Um, sometimes the mismatches are just mismatches in uh, the, the skills that the labor force has. So people graduate with uh, certain skills and the labor market needs slightly different skills. So there is gap in between. Sometimes it's geographical disbalances. You can find, for example, people with certain skills only in one geographical area, but the business in different geographical areas doesn't have enough um, uh, skilled people to employ. So that's a big problem, apparently, because um, if education is to, uh, it's a to contribute uh, to growth, it has to serve the business and the industry and not you know, just some abstract principles. So finally, e regarding excellence of the higher education institutions, again, too few of our Sorry, <laughs> too few of our uh, higher education institutions are uh, recognized as world, world cla uh, class higher education institutions if you consider the research oriented indexes, the global indexes of universe, uh, rankings of universities. So we have 4,000, around 4,000 higher education institutions in Europe. Of them, uh, only 200 are in the top 500 and only three are in the top 20. And apparently one of the most important reasons why that is the case is that uh, most European higher education institutions do not specialize enough. They try to compete in too many areas, uh, develop activities in too many areas. They cannot concentrate in where they have competitive advantage and therefore they can't excel in anything. So specialization seems to be the key uh, for the future, like really focusing on a few areas where this particular university or you know, college or whatever is good and you know, working in that direction. Uh, so here is, uh, you can see s if you are interested in any country, uh, this is the share of the uh, graduates in the, labor for in the working population. So we can see there US, Japan, all of them are higher than even the highest of, of the European um, results, Finland and uh, Ireland. And so if this is to change for the better, obviously not for the worse, <laughs> if this is to change for the better, uh, the European Union has mm, focused on a few key areas of reform. F there are five basic goals in five basic you know, uh, areas where uh, higher education, uh, education institutions and the state authorities should work. And this is what we will do now. We will go through each of them. The first one, increasing attainment levels. This is simply the quantity of graduates, of higher educa uh, education graduates at all levels. Uh, of education, higher education. And so the target here is the European target right now. It's that by uh, the year 2020, 40% uh, of all young people aged 30 to 34 should have achieved higher education or equivalent degree. Um, let's look at what is the case right now. Uh, it's not right now, but it's always statistics are always lagging behind a little bit. So the benchmark is, I had to twist it a little bit for you to see. <laughs> so the benchmark is in the pink. 
and most of the countries are under it. So the situation is not that great at the moment. The good thing is that if you look at the, the light blue, that's from 2000, and the dark blue is from 2010, the statistics. So there is apparent improvement, but still there is a lot of work to be done. Uh, so how can we achieve this benchmark, the 40%? Per, uh, uh, first of all, okay, let me show you also these are the national targets. Again, you can see which country is, is where. Uh, so this is the, the dark blue is the EU average, and it's at 34 and has to go to 40. And there are some countries which are above, but they still have higher mm, targets, so that in the end we can compensate, you know, in the average, <laughs> I guess. Uh, OK, so what shall we do? How do we achieve this? One uh, goal is uh, for higher education institutions to reach out to a broader section of society and motivate those people to enroll in higher education programs, including disadvantaged and vulnerable groups, let's say, I don't know, minorities, immigrants, uh, as well as uh, non-traditional learners, like adult and elderly people. Uh, you know, for most of us, when we say a student, we imagine somebody really young. <laughs> this has to probably change in the future because uh, more and more um, higher education should be um, accessible to people in different age groups, people that were already on the labor market and they come back for continuing education. Diversifying, reaching out as far as possible. This is the whole idea of, of, the, uh, of that agenda. Um, of course, in relation to that, it becomes really necessary to ensure that there is financial support for education for those people that are uh, from lower income groups. Because if you reach out to vulnerable and uh, disadvantaged groups, they will probably not have all the finances to pay for their education. So there has to be way, uh, there has to be, we have to find a way to ensure some financial support for, for, for those people if they are to enroll in higher education programs. Second, we should de uh, higher education institutions should develop, and also a national uh, education system, should develop very clear uh, routes for students to progress from vocational and other types of education into higher education. Uh, this can happen, happen for example, um, if the national qualification frameworks are based on learning outcomes uh, and not on some other abstract principles, and if they are linked to the European uh, qualification uh, framework. Because that makes it easier to determine how much from the previous education of that person um, is uh, relevant to the higher education that he or she is enrolling in, into, higher education program, and to recognize it. Otherwise, I if it's based on learning outcomes, you can say, yes, she has or she, he has achieved that, this, uh, has learned that and that, and we can recognize or validate this period of the vocational education in for the higher education program. Also, um, it's becoming more important to also uh, find, uh, uh, to develop very clear procedures how to recognize learning experience which was gained uh, outside formal education and training. Um, informal or non-formal, even work experience. Uh, that's also very important for adult learning because a lot of the things that people learn in their lives uh, is learned outside of the classroom. Maybe often it's more things learned outside of the classroom than inside the classroom. So basically uh, finding really very clear and transparent procedures to validate such skills and knowledge which, has ga which was gained outside of the formal education system uh, will help to, um, and will also motivate more people to, to enroll in higher education because they don't have to go through the whole 
process uh, once again. For example, if you want to enroll into a higher education program in tourism and you have experience in tourism, you have most likely learned a lot already. So finding a way to validate this experience would be a uh, very good, positive uh, development in the future. Then reducing dropout rates. This, of course, it's quite evident. We don't want people to start uh, higher education programs and not finish them. And then uh, the next thing is training more researchers. And again, the target here, uh, there is a European target uh, benchmark. It's 3% of GDP should be directed towards research investment by 2020. Uh, in order to do that, uh, currently it's uh, less than 2%. And we are very badly placed compared to the US and uh, Japan, where more is being invested into research. Um, so if we want to do that, we need 1 million new research jobs. So that means 1 million more people able to work in res research areas. Uh, so the challenge here is really squarely at the feet of higher education institutions. They have to train more doctoral candidates. Uh, in particular, it seems very important to attract more women um, into postgraduate degree programs because it seems that there is still potential in, the, in that gender category. Uh, less women are aspiring to get a doctoral degree right now. So, so this is one way to go. And then, of course, there is another challenge, which is to um, develop the general research skills of the workforce, like overall. I mean, there has to be, apart from doctoral candidates, there has to be also you know, improvement of the research skills of all the labor force, if you want to have a really research-focused, research-intensive economy. The second major goal, uh, which the agenda of, uh, for modernizing European higher, higher education system sets, it's improving the quality of higher education and its relevance to the needs of the society and the economy. Uh, in this area, the first and most important task of any higher education institution is really to uh, attune the curricula to both current and emerging needs on the labor market and the business. So, um, and higher education institutions are well advised to do that, not just in, in order to comply with the European agenda. Apparently, if they do that, uh, obviously, if they do that, their graduates will be much more employable. Uh, they will have very fast and uh, easy uh, mm, transition from education into the labor market. So uh, the idea is not just to adapt curricula now and then, like to put them into, in, to tune them in for, from time to time. The idea really is to ensure that every higher education institution regularly monitors uh, the changing needs of the business uh, industry and the economy as a whole and uh, regularly uh, adapts or um, modifies the curricula so that they are adequate. They adequately re reflect those needs. There are different ways to go there, like practically. One is uh, to uh, involve um, employers, uh, labor market institutions, uh, the industry into the development and uh, into the design and delivery of the study, pro of the, um, study programs. Another way is to exchange staff, uh, to, have st to in increase staff exchanges, meaning that um, it's possible to invite people <coughs> from the business or industry as uh, lecturers, even as guest lecturers. At the same time, it's good if the academic staff, the faculty um, is more often involved into, with, into some kind of uh, partnership with business, let's say, into applied research. That helps to, really the idea is to blur the divide between uh, education, 
meaning teaching and research and uh, business, just to, to have it, th this barrier kind of broken down so that uh, it's possible to have, uh, you know, flow of knowledge in between the, uh, between the two uh, spheres. Uh, then uh, one obvious way to do it is to have more practical training and practical experience included into the programs. And coming from the EUC where uh, this is a major, for us this is a major w area of, uh, we focus on that. We try to have as much practical experience and train, train sh traineeships, was internships uh, for students as possible. And I haven't heard a single student complain about that. They are happy. Uh, because they learn uh, uh, practical things that help them afterwards when they uh, uh, when they go to work. So that's one way to do it. Uh, obviously, it depends very much on uh, the area of higher education, but I guess in every area it's possible to make it more practically oriented. Uh, then the higher education institutions can also monitor the career path of their graduates, uh, see how they made it on the labor market, Were they, did they find a job, how quickly, because that will tell a lot about how relevant the study program is actually to the needs of the business. If, uh, if there is, for example, decrease in the uh, employment uh, outcomes uh, for graduates, then obviously something is wrong, so the, maybe the curricula has to be adapted. Uh, and so the most important thing is really to use all the possible information that we have, starting from uh, growth projections for the economy as a whole, for different sectors, um, um, uh, skills, uh, 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 was it, uh, yeah, pro not prognosis, how is the word? <laughs> Sorry, I can't find the word. Uh, forecasts of skills, uh, analysis of skills gaps, uh, also the graduate employment data, to use all that when uh, program, when study programs are being designed. Because when this is done, then it's almost sure that the study program will be relevant to what, was, what is going on in, in the wider economy outside the university. And having said that, of course it's mostly the higher education institutions that should do that, but state authorities can help a lot in that. Uh, if they use uh, quality assurance procedures and funding mechanisms to encourage or even to reward those higher education institutions that uh, are that provide education which is most relevant to the labor market, it's always possible to trace which higher education institution is most relevant to the needs of business, and maybe it's possible to somehow really reward those institutions through public funding that are doing that. So that's one mm, challenge for the state authorities in the future. Okay, the second uh, goal for higher education institutions is to develop uh, flexible and innovative learning approaches and methods of delivering education. This is important in order to make sure that the education is uh, of high quality education and second that it's relevant to uh, a very diverse group of learners. Going back to what I already said, the group of learners will be becoming more and more diverse. So higher education should um, develop such uh, flexible approaches and um, delivery methods to make sure that it stays relevant to all of those people, not just young persons coming from high school. Um, for example, different study modes, this is the most obvious way of going, part-time learning, distance learning, uh, modular learning, like going through different modules and stopping and coming back, continuing education. Also, uh, it's very important to use the potential of the uh, information and communication technologies including virtual learning platforms. It's going to be, I guess this is going to be more or less the future, like distance learning and virtual learning and stuff. Uh, and the 
ICTs can really make the learning experience as well as teaching and research very uh, effective and very personalized. And that's why it's effective because it's personalized for your needs. So this uh, really like, this is like a major area where all higher education institutions should focus like on using ICTs as much as possible to improve um, the quality of, of education and the way you de education is delivered. Uh, number three uh, goal, uh, higher education institutions should strive to improve the competence and motivation of teachers and researchers. Um, I th one of the m biggest problems, of course, especially in bigger universities, is uh, the overload of the mm, f teaching staff. If there are too many students and too few teachers uh, or lecturers, faculty. The faculty will not be able to focus on anything else apart from teaching. So that is one thing like really uh, recruiting sufficient staff considering the number of students. That is one important area. Uh, then uh, of course it's in order to improve uh, competence and motivation uh, higher education institutions can do their best to improve working conditions whatever that means. Every institution knows what is the problem if there is, and there are usually some problems. So improve working conditions, stick to very fair and transparent recruitment procedures, uh, make, make it possible for uh, faculty and staff to grow professionally, um, like really provide as many opportunities for professional development as possible. And then finally, of course, there is a recognition and reward for teaching and research excellence. Going back to the example of the fame of hall, uh, Hall of Fame, but not just the Hall of Fame, also maybe some financial uh, you know, stimuli <coughs> will be uh, in order to increase <coughs> motivation. This is really, every institution can develop its own strategy in this respect. It's not, there is no one blueprint how to, how to do that, but um, the idea is really to make sure that institutions are investing into their stuff, into their human capital. Uh, and then the fourth uh, major goal that is that is for higher education institutions to align uh, researcher training to the needs of the knowledge intensive economy lab and labor market, and especially to the needs of the uh, small and medium sized enterprises. This is about researcher training. For me, it this, I, if I have to translate it, if I have to imagine what it means in practice, simply means that in most uh, areas of education, it means bringing a little bit, uh, bring, bringing doctoral training a little bit more down to earth, away from more abstract academic subjects, down to subjects or, or research which is more relevant for um, the economy or the labor market. I guess it's not possible in every discipline. I, get, I cannot imagine uh, philosophy or <laughs> something like that, but whenever possible, this, this is really the idea. And this is the only way to really to re reach this goal of uh, having a research intensive economy. Because otherwise it will not work, we will not have the human capital for, for it to happen. The third main area of uh, reform according to the uh, higher education uh, modernization agenda of the European Union, strengthening quality through international mobility of students, researchers, and staff, then international internationalization of higher education and uh, more cross-border cooperation such as this one, <laughs> ours uh, right now. Um, here, there is again a target set for the European higher education area. It's to double the proportion of students who have completed a uh, study or a training period abroad to 20% by the year 2020. So now it's around 10, it has to become 20. More and more students should have at least part of their educational training in another European country. And so thanks to the European higher education area and the European research area, there is now very good compatibility and comparability between higher education systems in uh, uh, Europe. And this facilitates 
to a large extent individual mobility of students and staff uh, and faculty as well as cooperation between individual institutions but there is more to be desired there are apparently still obstacles remaining uh, so uh, the European Union really wants higher education institutions to focus on several future tasks which I have listed here one is uh, to eliminate all the barriers uh, which are necessary barriers uh, to switching institutions between bachelor and master level uh, the second thing is to ensure uh, efficient recognition of credits which are gained abroad during study abroad uh, this can happen through very effective quality assurance also a very consistent use of, uh, Europe, of uh, European credit transfer and accumulation uh, system and the diploma supplement as well as uh, by linking all qualifications received to the European qualifications framework because once you link it to the European qualifications framework it's very easy for the, the other institution to recognize it uh, as a credit gained abroad uh, number three, uh, higher education institutions in Europe should strive to attract the best students, academics and researchers from outside the EU, I guess much like the US does it now. Uh, first of all, it's important to improve access for those people and second, uh, it's not enough because even if they access, they might not want to stay. We it, it's necessary to improve uh, their uh, employment conditions and their prospects for professional development in Europe. So this is um, like more generally like the, the, ba the basic tasks that uh, higher education institutions should uh, uh, focus on in this respect. Number four, like uh, area number four, strengthening the knowledge triangle between education, research, and business. Uh, I think yesterday, uh, one of the presenters, I don't remember who, uh, spoke about the uh, open innovation. So this uh, recent business trend toward open innovation has already led to much more cooperation between business, research institutions, and higher education. Uh, but uh, looking at the European higher education institutions in general, they do not exploit the potential for knowledge transfer. Most of them not even remotely, are not even remotely close to exploiting it fully. So um, this has to happen, really, like focus on knowledge transfer. Uh, several key things are important in this respect. The first one is pretty obvious. So uh, education in all disciplines, in all three cycles, should stimulate uh, the development of entrepreneurial, creative, and inno innovation skills. And generally, it should strive to promote innovation. Uh, higher education should strive to promote innovation at all levels. Uh, the second thing is that uh, the knowledge transfer infrastructure of higher education institutions needs to be strengthened. Mm, as well as their capacity to uh, implement uh, uh, applied, uh, to carry out applied research, sometimes directly tailored to the needs of business, uh, is to s engage into uh, startup and spin off companies. That's one way. Like, again, as you can see, the, the, the barrier between education uh, or the, the different, the border between education and business has to be <coughs> blurred, has to become more permeable in a way to allow for knowledge to flow freely in both directions. Uh, higher education institutions should actually, <coughs> that's one thing that is really about the priorities of higher education institutions. Apart from teaching and research, and all that uh, traditional uh, roles of higher education institutions, it seems they have to make uh, uh, the, create the establishment of partnerships with business uh, one of their core activities. It's not to say that it should uh, overrule all other priorities, but it has to be one of the key priorities. 
Uh, and here again, the state can do a lot to encourage. I mean, obviously, higher education institutions can realize the potential in that and can do it on their own, but the state has to encourage. Meaning, one, to provide incentives, and second, to reduce all the uh, regulative, administrative, <coughs> and um, financial barriers to the creation of such partnerships. Because if the state puts the brakes on partnership, it's po not possible to happen. So that uh, is really a challenge both for higher education institutions and for the state authorities or whatever, authorities uh, dealing with education. And uh, another major goal for higher education institutions is that they should really act as the, center, the centers of knowledge and expertise. And as such, they have to do their best to contribute to the economic development in the regions in which they are situated, uh, or territories. They can become uh, centers of uh, knowledge networks, or uh, they can become parts of clusters. And if I can, you know, I can give the example of the UC, which is uh, together with other institutions, is currently, for example, um, a part of a cluster um, which is focused on culinary arts in the south, uh, in the northeastern part of Bulgaria. So the cluster really is uh, it uh, puts together business uh, actors, whatever, um, in different fields related to culinary arts and tourism. And as a supporting role, higher education institutions and other education and training institutions. They, they really act as, uh, they, they have the supporting role in the cluster. They provide training, they provide expertise, uh, knowledge. So for us, uh, we have been doing this for a year already. And just before we came here, we applied for, um, the cluster applied for additional funding to, uh, to expand its activities. And really at the moment in Bulgaria, uh, there is public funding for the creation of clusters in different sectors. Uh, and this is really a key precondition for the competitiveness of the economy, like uh, making business networks and creating clusters with uh, the participation of research institutions and education institutions and business. This is a major, uh, uh, a few very important future uh, area of direction. But having said that, as I said, there is public funding and the state so again, it's a double challenge, a challenge for both the state and the higher education institutions. So for the state to provide such funding to encourage uh, higher education institutions to be part of clusters or business networks, and for higher education institutions to be proactive in searching for ways to finance or to make it possible for such clusters to appear at the regional level. The fifth a important area of uh, reform, according to the European Higher Education Agenda, um, this is, and this is our area, yeah. <laughs> where our project comes, uh, effective governance and funding mechanisms in support of excellence. Okay. Just to compare us again with the US and Japan, currently the European Union is uh, investing into higher education, total investment into higher education, it's 1.3% of GDP. In the US, it's 2.7. So apparently uh, not enough funding for higher education at the moment. Uh, the European higher, ed uh, higher education modernization agenda doesn't change you know, dramatically the funding principles. It's uh, public investment, uh, public investment and public funding still remains uh, the basis for sustainable and high quality higher education, but it's not going to be enough. That's already clear, totally clear that it's not going to be enough. So uh, several things should be done if uh, 
higher education in Europe should receive adequate fun funding in order to uh, sustain the high quality and to become more research oriented. First of all, public spending should be targeted much more, caref or caref more carefully than it is now. Uh, that could happen, for example, by uh, linking funding mechanisms to performance by the higher education institution, mm -hmm. uh, as well as to uh, the different institutional profiles. And that goes back again to that problem which I mentioned, that higher education institutions uh, compete on too many levels. They don't focus, they don't specialize. So if the public funding mechanism is such that it uh, allows, that it takes into account the profile of that institution uh, and, you know, encourages it to focus on that profile, on that on this particular competitive advantages that it has, that will be great because then uh, institutions can specialize and become and s s excel in particular areas. So that's for public spending. Um, then higher education institutions themselves should try to diversify uh, sources of funding, obviously. Uh, they can use public funds to leverage private investment or other public investments, for example, by match funding or something. Also, tuition fees are becoming more and more common, and they would probably stay common, I guess, because that's one way of funding, uh, of receiving adequate funding to for high quality higher education. Then, uh, funding and governance systems should become more flexible, mm, and all the le uh, not as many as possible legal, financial, and administrative restrictions should be uh, relaxed in order to allow higher education institutions, first of all, to attract uh, private revenue, private funding. Second, to, for example, to own their own infrastructure, to make capital investment, uh, as well as to be more autonomous when they recruit staff. So um, it's that obviously goes in the direction of giving more autonomy to higher education institutions. And autonomy meaning like almost in everything. Um, but uh, that leads us to the last point. If higher education institutions receive more autonomy, they should do their best to take advantage of it. And uh, the best way to do it is to really invest into professional management, to create, develop professional higher education leaders who will be able to use that newly gained autonomy to uh, set strategic direction, to manage uh, incomes, to manage uh, mm, academic affairs in the best possible way, to uh, recruit the best researchers and uh, uh, faculty. Um, so, yeah, I think I don't have to speak more because this is all about what we already spoke in the last three days. And I'm, is there, d does anyone want to jump in and discuss maybe how they see? Uh, because I could say how about the contribution of the EU, but I don't think it's important that much. Okay, okay. Shall I? Yeah, I think we can. Uh, we can uh, but maybe there are because the maybe there are questions or just comments. Are there any questions? Because I have a lot of questions for you for our partners from the partner countries because so much data uh, getting mentioned here. Uh, that we don't, we don't have an idea what, our, what the state is for in other countries. So maybe if, if we... Uh, oh, that's very short. Yeah, if, we can, if, if you could finish and then uh, okay. we'll, we'll have a Q&A section for, uh, directed to the audience from us to you. Um, basically, most of the goals and the key problems <coughs> that I mentioned, as I said, these are problems for higher education institutions and states to address. But uh, just to mention that the European Union is really devoted to supporting the whole process all the time. Um, and they, these are the four areas in which the European Union itself says it will be most supportive. Uh, apparently, there are more, but these are the four most important, let's say. So the first one is um, monitoring, collecting data, conducting, analysis, uh, conducting research, analysis, uh, providing policy recommendations, 
this is very valuable from the side of the EU because it can help, uh, it can be uh, used as input from higher education institutions when they are developing their own priorities. Uh, especially um, the most fruitful areas for e European Union involvement here, uh, where the European Union can provide the best uh, information is uh, about skills uh, gaps, uh, forecasts of uh, sk future skills, uh, analysis of current skill uh, skills at the labor mar on the labor market, employment outcomes of graduates, as well as there is um, now that initiative to develop multidimensional ra ranking of higher education institutions, because most of, as I, I even mentioned in the beginning, most of the global rankings of universities uh, right now are <coughs> research oriented, and the European Union is now trying to um, create a multidimensional ranking that will take into account other areas, such as teaching, um, links with the yes, links with business, uh, knowledge transfer, uh, contribution to regional development, and stuff like that. The second thing that the EU does, mo and it has a great role to play here, apparently, to remove obstacles to European learning mobility. Um, for example, further strengthening the European credit transfer system. <coughs> um, also, I guess this uh, new uh, Erasmus Master Degree Mobility Scheme is in that direction as well, because it makes it easier for, in, um, it facilitates individual mobility. And the other two, uh, two areas, are, uh, I think we already spoke a lot about them. Uh, there is a lot of initiative, uh, initiatives, a lot of funding going to uh, measures which are aimed at promoting innovation, uh, <coughs> at promoting research mobility, <coughs> at uh, strengthening the knowledge triangle and uh, supporting the flow of knowledge between uh, higher education and business. And uh, the fourth area is that the European Union really provides a very useful common framework for all countries, all higher education institutions, in their I interaction with the um, rest of the world, academic interaction with the rest of the world. Uh, and in that way, it really helps the internationalization of higher education. So back to Christina. Thank then. you so much. Thank you, Yeri. Um, thank you for the brilliant presentation. I forgot to mention in the very beginning uh, that uh, Yeri actually has a PhD from the Central European University in Budapest, <laughs> and uh, she's the expert in uh, innovation and policy center at the moment. But I used to learn from this. It's pretty obvious from the presentation she she uh, provided us with, uh, provide us with. So really very informative and, and very exhaustive when it comes to the modernization agenda in higher education. Uh, and since uh, we more or less uh, uh, yeah, we spoke about the uh, EU perspective and what's happening on the EU side. As I mentioned uh, an instant ago, we would like very much to hear from you guys what's happening in the partner countries. And to give you a uh, uh, start with a question is, what are the percentages of, um, of the number of graduates in your country? We saw how it looks like right now in the EU, but what about, let's say, Romania, blah, 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 and what, are, what, what is in uh, Romania? average or approximate and an estimation so how many people uh, with higher education degree are out there on the labor market in, in your country I mean, in Romania, Belarus, Ukraine so do you have any idea an estimation is it 50 or 10 50 or 15 it depends on specialty uh, maybe give it to her yeah. uh, humanities for a lot of the uh, a lot of lower, but uh, the demand is getting low. But we are coming to say technological specialties, I mean in engineering. For example, IT, power engineering, they are demanding roughly 70-75% they are after graduating working. But say in mining engineering or in machinery, heavy machinery, put it is a maximum, say, 15, 20 percent. So to say, just uh, totally, of course, totally, we can say that somehow it comes to 35, 40 percent. So but you're very close the, to the yes, benchmark of Europe. 35, 40 percent, it is not a real indicator because I told you in 
different so fields, yeah. it's very, very, you know, the, the dispersion is very huge. And another issue will be uh, if those graduates are working by their majors. Because some of them mm -hmm. are employed, but it's not necessarily true that they'll be employed in their own field. Mm -hmm. No, I mean in, all, uh, I mean no, in the field, field. yes. But when I'm talking about well, in your area, it's easier, but in the yes. he or she is relevant. Yeah, I see. That's why I mentioned that, for example, I know about the situation in engineering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I understand. And what about the other countries, Moldova, Ukraine, colleagues, do you have any idea of how many, what's the percentage of, let's say, people aged 30 to 35 with a high education degree on the labor market out there? Very high income group. I mean, I don't, I don't have exact statistics. But mm -hmm. Approximately? Very high. Very high? Uh, okay. Yeah, very high because... Um, um, so high in Georgia? Like 90% of the, no, 93% of the school, school leavers uh, uh, apply for the, uh, for the university. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, we have approximately 40,000 applicants every year, and we receive uh, more around than 30,000. Yeah, 30, uh, around 35,000 get seats in, in the university. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there are some dropouts, but the dropouts uh, from the university at the undergraduate level are not that high. So not that high. Okay. I mean, again, I don't have the mm. figures, but from, from, from what you know, so Georgia is com com uh, performing well uh, within the, uh, the first year. Uh, this is the best the question indeed. It depends what we, what we consider as a job. Mm -hmm. okay. Most of them are working, but, but in most uh, cases, particularly in human yeah, resources and sciences, <laughs> they are not working according to the degrees they obtain from okay. the university. Mm -hmm. I mean, not infrequently, you meet taxi drivers with two di diplomas mm -hmm. in their houses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mm -hmm. count as the employee at the level of employment for the university mm -hmm. they graduate from. In, in but our is it society, so it's a tradition to go to the high yes. education. Yes. To graduate from. Okay. Okay. In any case. Okay. And what about then? What about the youth unemployment? Can I have your attention, please? What about the youth unemployment rate then? Uh, the the situation with the youth is so uh, it's bad. It, it's a bad uh, my example is bad one because I'm a private university and 95 percent of my graduates are working of my yeah, school. Yeah, but it's a very small yeah. So I, I'm yeah. It's a small university, so I'm not. I don't have the overall. Uh, so you don't you don't know the for example, if you, if you take the medical university or technical university, the unemployment rate will be much more higher. Mm -hmm. So the business education and the lawyers are higher or lower. Unemployment will be high. Unemployment. It doesn't mean that you have a diploma that you are working you know, in our country. No, it doesn't, yeah. There is more it required than just a degree, degree around. Yeah. You're right, you're right. Uh, yeah? In our country, the level of high education is very high. It is approximately 70% or even more. And in our country, we have uh, some strange problem, maybe for you. You have too many people with high education, at all people with uh, uh, fewer education, uh -huh, with uh -huh. professional education. <coughs> okay, so. And uh, if you have high education, sometimes it is more difficult to find jobs if you have uh, professional education. But is it because higher education degrees are more uh, academic and not so practice oriented or business oriented? And then it's difficult to, to uh, have the right people with the right vocational skills out there on the market? So is it due to this? So is it more theoretical than practical? I mean, the, the idea is that there are no, oh, I'm sorry. This is all about discovery. The idea is that there are not so many companies who are mm -hmm. demanding uh, those graduates. High skilled so people. Like, in business, they are graduating like 10,000 people, but we don't have so many companies mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. them to hire. Yeah, the medical university, which produces, uh, which has, um, so, over 6,000 uh, students right now. They study six years each. Probably, they pr the approximately they would produce around 900 people. I mean, 800, mm -hmm. taking into account the dropout. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. of course, I mean, there is no. There is. There are no. 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 Uh, they can do work places. Doctor. Okay. Doctor but on the other hand, for example, uh, I mean, this is not nothing to do with statistics, but it's uh, one example. Uh, from the 100 uh, groupmates that my brother had uh, who studied medicine for 12 years, there are only six who work as doctors right now. Mm. The rest By the way, I have a medical background. Yeah. 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 You're also a doctor? 
In your previous one? Okay. And how does it look with research and funding for research? Because, you know, uh, Europe would like to have 3% 3 3 of the GDP dedicated, devoted to research and uh, education. What about your countries? Uh, Bulgaria is, I think, 1.3 or 1.2, 1.3, so far below the, the benchmark. What about, I know Finland is about the, the 3%. I think it's approximately 4% of the GDP of Finland goes for for research. So up there in Scandinavia, there are some really good examples. What about your country? So uh, Armenia, Belarus, do you, do you have any idea about the... Don't know it. Mm. But, <laughs> but is it even close to? No. no, no, no. no. Decreasing. Yeah, Decreasing. Uh huh. Okay. Mm. Yeah, yeah, they stay there. Did they ever hear here that Belarus is 2%? Uh, okay. That's 2%. That's not so bad, actually. Two. It's, it's not bad at all compared to my country. And uh, since we mentioned so research and obviously uh, the knowledge triangle is uh, a key issue, a key term uh, also uh, in the agenda, uh, you know, education, research and business, uh, linking education, business and research, Can I would be we would be interested to know from you, to hear from you to what extent actually building clusters, creating opportunities for knowledge transfer, making um, an effort to make a difference on uh, on regional level, hence actually have regional uh, contribution to the regional development. So to what extent is this developed in, 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 in the partner countries? So linking business education and, and research. So is this on the agenda for you, for your, your institution? So do you speak a lot? Do you have clusters? Do you have spin-offs? Do you have opportunities for business startups at your schools? <coughs> hmm? uh, yeah, I know you know. <laughs> Georgia, I mean, public universities yeah. were until very recently, some pub not all public universities until very recently were not able to do that legally. Oh. Uh, now some public universities have been given um, possibility to change, to apply and to apply for the change in their mm -hmm. legal status, and GSB is one of the first ones which mm -hmm. did so. Uh, now we've turned it to a non-commercial, non-profit legal entity that allows us to uh, engage in, in some sort of like education related to economic activities uh, among uh, including but not limited to establishing startups so far we have not done that but it's I mean it's very fresh our status changed only a few months ago mm -hmm. so I assume that the um, Georgia Guadashvili from the my colleague from the science and development department should be working mm -hmm. on that uh, before that, we, we technically we were not able to do that. Because so there were legal, there were legal uh, obstacles. I am not sure if uh, the same pathways would apply to the private universities. Probably not. I don't know. So you can create yeah, partnerships yeah. with. So can you create partnerships uh, with with the business in Georgia in, with, in, within yeah, the private university universities? You will not find an university which will say that research will have to be separate and business yeah. has to be separate and, and the education has to be separate. Mm -hmm. All three of them, everyone wants to be like that. Yeah, everyone wants to do it. The, the thing yeah, is how they do it in reality. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, talking money is always a tricky uh, thing, but I have to ask also um, because we were curious about linking actually funding, public funding to performance. To what extent is this developed or has been developed in your country? So for instance, being on, on the top of any national ranking as a higher education institution, does it mean that you, uh, that institution would, got, uh, would get more funding? No. Do you have this in? No, our no. funding is um, uh, based on uh, tuition fees. We don't, even though we are a public university, we don't get a penny from the state. Even as a public university? We don't get, no, we don't 
No, nothing. From the from the state, what we get is tuition fee and whatever our professors get as the grants, both at national science foundation uh, applications and internationally. Mm -hmm. Our tuition fee is the, the grant based, so there is a lump of sum. We have the national examination, so they will say that they are financing 30% of the top students. Mm -hmm. And that student might go to TCU or to my university. But this comes to university. So funding follows the student, basically. Yeah. And uh, the grant moves to the student, whether he goes to the private or yeah. to the public. So and it's not saying money given to an institution, it's money given to a student. To the student. Mm -hmm. studies, but there is a competition yeah. for the student. For example, That's great. If I, as a student, decide to go to TCU first year with, with the grant that I received from the State and then I change my mind and move to a private university, I move with my money. So, okay, okay. Now, yeah, from, from this year. Now, they return. Oh, no. <laughs> you say it's like <laughs> it's it's it <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Armenia, you've got that too? Funding no, following the student? Yeah, we have all the time. State universities, as our case, not private, state mm -hmm. universities, they have about 20% of students. Just which will be funded, cover the education <laughs> fee by government. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that the students, for example, when they, they enter again, coming out from the results of competition, I mean entering the grants, mm -hmm. say 20% of the best, they get this, I mean, uh, As a scholarship. Uh -huh. free, yes, the okay. position. But it doesn't mean that it will be continued for all the, it is only for the first year. Afterwards, they have to after, perform after, after and prove. After each year, depending okay. on your progress, on their demand, it could be changed. So it's merit-based. So yes. Great. Student, yes. Sounds yes. like a very so fair this system. This percent is fixed, of course. They 20 percent mm -hmm. tuition free. Mm -hmm. Others should pay it. But who is paying? Of course, it's always changing by the end of each academic year mm -hmm. in what each state university. Mm -hmm. right? What about Ukraine? Ukraine is, thank you. What about Ukraine? Ukraine is uh, so largely represented in our consortium. What is the situation? Ihor, I know you're an uh, expert in financial management, so probably you know about that too, <laughs> about fi pr public funding. To what extent? Uh, it depends on the number of students enrolled. On the number of the students enrolled? Yeah. Sorry, the okay. So it's a per capita kind of yeah. uh, approach. So the more, mm -hmm. and, and it's not linked to performance of the students. If, uh, you, if your uh, funding is um, based on the uh, number of enrolled students, we guarantee to form that you're going to be able yeah, to it, it more students than you are physically able to. to Pardon? If they apply to my university with students, yeah. then the quality is good. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they would apply to other universities. Ah, uh, well, yes, that is true, but um, not always, actually. Uh, who, who is the one who, maintain, who maintains the um, status that the whatever you provide, I mean, students might believe that whatever you, you offer is good for him or her, but who is the body which guarantees that it is actually the type of education students should be getting? Minister. Minister is checking out all the time. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any more questions on your side? Yeah, of course, go ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And successfully. Every three years, and we get sometimes how many students we can enroll. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's Maximum. it's linked to performance of the institutions yeah. in some in one way or another. If it if it dependent depends on the results of the uh, accreditation. Okay, thank you. Um, I probably have many, 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 many more questions, but um, I think we'll have the opportunity to, to speak about the European modernization agenda over the next many meetings we're going to have uh, in the remaining uh, more than 20 uh, months of the project. The problem, this is the biggest problem, and it's really at the heart of the, uh, of, uh, of, of the project as well. As I said in the very beginning, so the reason for choosing this topic today and for asking Gary to speak about the modernization agenda was is that this was actually the policy context we used when we started to develop the, 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 the project itself. So I, I hope you did gain understanding uh, uh, if you have, any, uh, have, uh, have had any questions about the project, why, and etc. So now you know what we wanted to actually achieve in the first place. So thank you very much for your participation and, and most of all thank you to Gagana. And um, let's have a short break.
and to give you a short, a short overview of the remaining of the program for, for the rest of the day, uh, after the short break we'll get uh, to dissemination, work package 9, and uh, uh, that workshop will be led by, um, by uh, Valentina from, from Armenia, so she, she's the work package leader and also in charge of dissemination. She will be coordinating the process uh, within the consortium. Um, and afterwards we're going to have lunch and uh, after lunch we'll uh, wrap up and uh, very, very closely, very closely, we'll, uh, uh, very shortly we'll speak about uh, the upcoming activities. So basically summarize uh, the workshops, uh, the results of the work workshops uh, on Tuesday, the work, work, uh, work, uh, work package three and work package four. And last but not least, uh, make sure that everybody knows how to get ready for Portugal in October. Mm. Okay, thank you for your attention. Enjoy the coffee now. Mm.